Today in Memo to the President, the topic is Rebuild Financial Institutions and Confidence. Hello, I'm Gigi Hinton, along with Brookings Senior Fellow Martin Bailey, author of the memo. Martin, you say that uh, President-elect Obama is walking into one of the most challenging economic situations any president has in the last 50 years or so, last 60 years perhaps. What's the situation? The situation is ugly. I don't think I've ever seen um, an economic downturn quite like this. We had a very bad downturn in uh, 1982 when unemployment was very high, but the kind of fear and instability around uh, financial institutions and now around jobs and the overall economy, I think is really quite unprecedented in the post-World War II period. So this really is a, a challenge. Okay, so what you write is what he has to do is rebuild financial institutions and restore confidence. How does he do that? Well, there are some short-term measures that will be needed, like a stimulus package, and uh, we're going to talk about that in, in other sessions of these transition sessions. But uh, what I talk about in the, in the memo to the president is how to kind of rebuild in the longer run uh, financial confidence and financial institutions. Um, I think one of the, the most important things, well, if we, if we look at what's happened to the Federal Reserve, I think by and large they've done the right things in response to this crisis. I would fault them for some of the stuff prior to the crisis, things they could have done to perhaps uh, forestall the crisis or at least uh, mitigate it. But since the crisis happened, I think Bernanke and his colleagues at the Fed have done a terrific job. So one thing I'd like to see uh, President Obama do is give an endorsement of uh, Bernanke and say, look, this guy needs to stay on the job as we get through uh, this crisis. It's a long-term problem, Martin, but what can we do most immediately? When you look at Treasury, I think it's more, um, you know, it's more sort of up in the air. I think Paulson has made some serious mistakes, uh, as even he, I think, has admitted, and he's sort of changed direction a little bit. The original design of the top, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, has not been what we now have, and he's shifted over towards um, investing in, in financial institutions. I think that was the right thing to do. You have to recapitalize the banks. What happens when you have a crisis like this is that banks and other institutions take large losses. And that means it eats into their capital, and then they are basically underwater themselves. So these underwater mortgages are translating into financial institutions that are underwater. And the only way we can deal with that on a national level or even on a global level is ha by having governments, or in our case, the Treasury, actually investing in the banks and providing more capital. So that's something that needs that, that now is being done right. I think uh, the new team of... Um, uh, Summers and Geithner understand that and will continue that uh, process forward. You write about transparency. What do we need to do there? When you invest in something, you have to know what the risks are that are behind that investment. So people have to report uh, their own exposure to risk, the resources they have set aside for risk. We, we currently have trillions of dollars. I think it's something like $70 trillion worth of outstanding credit default swaps, and there's really not enough capital to pay those off. So we're sort of buying an insurance policy, but the people we're buying the insurance from don't have the resources to pay off in the event that we, we need them to. So we need much more transparency. We need those securities to be traded uh, on exchanges and not just uh, in, in the one-on-one -on -one over, uh, over the counter market. Uh, so we need to improve that mechanism by which people who have their own money at risk know what they're doing, and will take the actions to preserve uh, their, their capital. Martin Bailey, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next week. What can the president-elect do to restore confidence in the economy? The American public owns a very significant share of the American economy in a way it did not before. He needs to put a huge dollop of money into the economy. Since we do own it, we're going to start making the rules. He needs to be able to show that he's creating jobs. In the financial uh, situation that we find ourselves in needs to be reversed. And that's what I think. Hello, I'm Ron Nesson, along with Brookings Senior Fellow Steve Hess, author of What Do We Do Now? The Workbook for the President-Elect. Steve, uh, you have a chapter on speech writing in the White House, and of course you know something about that from first-hand experience since you were a White House speechwriter. 
Yeah, uh, let me give an example of what a speechwriter better do, which is, of course, be inside the head and the persona of the person you're writing for. Uh, I was an Eisenhower speech speechwriter. Uh, he was the oldest president at the time. I was the youngest speechwriter <laughs> uh, at the time. Uh, I was writing a speech about the changes in the defense budget, uh, the need to have by missiles. And I talked about today's missiles will be tomorrow's Tin Lizzie's. Tin Lizzie's, of course, was what the Model T original Ford car was. Uh, and I remember an article then in a local, in a Washington paper that said, ha, look at that. Only somebody that old could have remembered, could remember the Tin Lizzie. And I felt very proud of myself because it reflected that I had been enough inside uh, of, of President Eisenhower to use a phrase like Tin Lizzie. Well, of course, uh, President-elect Obama has speechwriters and mm -hmm. he's a, he delivers a speech very, very well. But will he have to vastly expand his speechwriting staff uh, once he gets in the White House? Well, they make a lot of speeches these days. Uh, you go back to Herbert Hoover and they may be made eight a month. By the time you get to Bill Clinton, they're making 28 uh, a month. So uh, he will have a team of speechwriters. One, one can't possibly write uh, a major speech a day. And does a speechwriter, or doesn't a speechwriter, have to be close to the president to sort of accurately reflect his views? Well, certainly they reflect his views because it goes through many drafts. As some major speeches can go, say to the Union, can go 13, 14, 15 drafts. A draft changes its number every time the president sees it. So you can be sure if it's 13 drafts, it means it's been seen by the president and changed 13 times. So uh, you're, you're, it's, the, it's the president's thoughts that are coming through. Maybe your words are helping but it's the president's thoughts that are always there. Well, I did want to ask you about that process. Now, I, I think it's true, uh, and from my own experience in the White House and being a little bit of a student of history, every president really has a different way of getting speeches written, or, or let me put it this way, of how much input they want into this process. Oh, sure. You have, uh, you have a president like Lyndon Johnson sort of sent everybody off to write a speech. He looked at them over. I, I like that one, threw the rest of them out. Uh, but that's an unusual, that's a, an unusual uh, process. Usually, uh, but every president is different. Richard Nixon, for example, had three very different speech writers. One was when he wanted to be very serious, and one was when he wanted to be very tough, and one was he even when he wanted to be funny. So you have different ones who did different things for him. Well, I know there's a man in Washington who we both know who has been a joke writer yeah. uh, for presidents for a long time. Yeah. I was worked for Eisenhower. We didn't have to write many jokes. I can think of only <laughs> one joke I think I had to write in the, in the two and a half years I worked for him. That was for the Alfred E. Smith dinner where you're expected to have a little something that's funny. Steve, thank you very much. And we'll be back next week. I'm Ron Nesson. Be a part of the presidential transition. Join our pundits and experts for The Scouting Report, our live web chat every Wednesday afternoon at 1230. Log on to www.brookings.edu transition.